Hold on on tight tight for the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the the alternative alternative to the alternative alternative media. It's a place, a, place, a special, special place, place where, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Affirmative. Okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, people of all races, colors, and creeds, welcome back to the greatest show on earth, the Investigative Journal. I'm Greg Anthony, back for another jam-packed show of information that you don't get anywhere else. You know, we were called the alternative to the alternative media, even before the alternative media was called the alternative media, if you can follow that one. Well, anyway, stay tuned. This show is going to be a follow-up of uh, the show I did yesterday. I have several shows I want to do on this subject, and it refers to a statement that President Trump mentioned the other day when he was giving his speech regarding uh, his first campaign speech of the year in Ohio. And uh, he mentioned that there is a lot of evil in the world. And of course he was referring to the Iran crisis. But anyway, I wanted to follow up on that thought that there is a lot of evil in the world. And you know, we looked at it yesterday, and I'm trying to uh, do this in three or four parts. We're going to look at a list of maybe the 15 most evil people in the world. Isn't it interesting? Most people have a list of evil people. And uh, I wanted to present one here today. Well, I wanted to present that I'm going to present 25 evil people or 15 evil people or 10 evil people. One of the people on the list, I'm just going to tease you a little bit, is going to be Dwight D. Eisenhower. Greg, oh no, there you go again, saying things that you can't say those things in America. He was a president of the United States, revered a world leader, the leader of World War II, and you're saying he's one of the most evil men in the world? What is wrong with you? Oh my God, that's why I was told years ago by the godson of Father Paul Marchinkus, the head of the Vatican Bank. He was a bishop cardinal. Also, he was also in the P2 Lodge. Can you believe that? He was a Masonic Lodge member. And the godson told me, Greg, you start making statements like this, you're never going to get anywhere. Well, anyway, I didn't pay attention. So anyway, we're going to get to that. We're also talked about some. We're going to talk about evil locations in the world, and I mentioned a few of those yesterday. Uh, one is the Vatican Hill. Oh, there we go, in trouble again. We're going to talk about evil rituals in the world, and uh, those we talked about are going to be blood sacrifices in, in, uh, to goddesses, sacred cannibalism, burning human sacrifice, sacred calls to demons, sacred celibacy of priests. Now, how can that be evil? Holy Inquisition. And I put holy in quotes. It was a bloody Inquisition. But anyway, this sacrifice to the gods is interesting. And we went over ISIS yesterday and the relationship between ISIS, the obelisk, and the Vatican Square obelisk, the Washington, D.C. obelisk, and of course, London's obelisk. And I I always ask the question, what the hell are they doing there? I mean, this gives you an idea how deeply uh, satanic this whole thing goes, for the lack of a better word. Uh, Burning human sacrifice, that's an interesting one. Uh, Doing research, we're going to talk just a second about that, and I'm going to get back to the main point of the show today, which is going to be what, Greg? What's it going to be? Well, there's evil organizations, and I'm going to get to the next one today after talking about the Illuminati, giving you a very in-depth definition and understanding of it yesterday, more than just the thing you'll hear on the um, you know, web. Oh, a bunch of elites, you know, pulling the strings behind the world leaders. Well, it goes a lot deeper than that. And today we're going to talk about the Nazi SS. Okay. We also talked about the Jesuits yesterday. I want to finish with that today, then get to the Nazi SS. But this idea of burning human sacrifice. There's information, it's it's very interesting, that came out that's never talked about regarding the Holocaust. And the Holocaust, basically, most people believe that the people were gassed 
in the gas chambers and then put in the put in the ovens to burn. However, one or two investigators started digging deep into this, and the question has to be asked: Were they dead when they left the gas chamber? Remember the showers where the gas was thrown down through the the ceiling, and then they were hauled off into the ovens. These researchers state that it was a human sacrifice where these people were not dead and they actually were screaming as they were being burnt in the ovens. So, burning human sacrifice going on in the 1940s still goes on and it started hundreds and hundreds of years ago. We'll get to that more in depth on this series of there is a lot of evil in the world. But anyway, back to the evil organizations. Okay, I talked about the Illuminati, which included the Jesuits, and then specifically I went into the Jesuits. And to lead into uh, the Nazi SS, I wanted to finish with Jesuit education, because it's really important. We talked yesterday about how the Jesuits are just a military order, but not so. That's what they were created, a military order to stomp out Protestantism, right? They were architected to be able to undertake all kinds of dangerous missions, from assassinations, propaganda, theft, forgery, you name it. Their primary mission was and remains today the complete defeat of all forces in opposition to the authority of the Roman Catholic Pope, specifically the Protestant movement. You know, even in the 16th century, the Catholic Church sought to suppress and control trade and education through the combination of papal law, deeds, and occasional force. Now, today, folks, this is going on all over the world in different ways, of course. But there are over 200 concordats, and a concordat basically is a treaty or whatever, a written, signed document between a country and the Vatican, whether they be communist, socialist, fascist, dictators, Democrats, they get involved with everybody. And there's over 200 of them in the world. And for somebody to say that they're not the richest organization in the world is overlooking this. Go to a place called Concordit.com to read about it. It's amazing. And I follow that website, and I really appreciate the people that put it together because it's really important. You know, so we have this Jesuit education, right? And of all the consequences of the Reformation, the most dangerous to the Catholic Church, after all the blood and everything was spilled, was still education. If people get smart, if people are allowed to read the unabridged, you know, uh, history of the world or what's going on, boy, they're not able to be controlled. And it is why the Jesuits were forced to adopt a counter position in education at an, even an early stage of their existence. And I think, you know, at this point, let me mention something that's also interesting because back in the annals of my shows, I happened to run across a couple of people that were really, one who was a, a student of musicology and wrote a book about Amadeus Mozart. And then, of course, I ran into another researcher that wrote a book about Shakespeare. And when you start reading what they uncovered, you can make two assumptions, okay, and make two pretty good arguments that, one, Mozart was not the child prodigy, and these, uh, all of his writings and all of his uh, musical work was not written by him but others. Who are those others? I think you know what I'm going to say. But the same thing went for Shakespeare. And this information is never going to be believed because people say, oh, it was Shakespeare. But anyway, when you get into the, the idea of Jesuit education, even back then in Jesuit entertainment, how they control Hollywood today, it isn't a far reach to see what they did with Shakespeare. And that he could have never written those and they had to be written by a bunch of very intelligent Jesuits who were controlling, even back then, what the people were being, you know, going to the theater to be entertained. Very interesting. And I'll tell you what, when you start looking at these, go back to some of the shows, when you start looking at some of the information, 
you know, you may want to reconsider what I said as not being totally crazy, right? Oh, Shakespeare didn't exist, and oh, Mozart wasn't the child prodigy he said he was. So anyway, the Jesuits were involved in education a long time ago. And it's why they were forced to take this counter position. Using their powers, their unheralded powers, the Jesuits established a counter education movement to the Protestants using their priceless access to the secret Vatican archives. The Jesuits dedicated themselves to manipulating every major stream of science and philosophy against the Protestant intellectuals, including subverting their secret societies. The recruitment and promotion of education had a secondary benefit for the Jesuits in that it ensured the higher caliber recruits and made their services more attractive across the Catholic world. Jesuits quickly became known as the great educators, the order dedicated to education. They still exist today that way. The excellence in Catholic countries and perverse, and perverse notion considering their original purpose for existence was a Purely military. It's purely a military organization. So anyway, we find that, I find that quite interesting. And just to end this a little bit, when I read about Jesuitism and their control of education even today, there's two words that come to mind that you have to understand. And let me read this to you a little bit. I picked this up uh, on an introduction to a book by Robert Cook these two paragraphs. And also, I want to explain it a little bit from Rulers of Evil, a book that you have to read uh, by Tupper Saucy. Actually, I interviewed him a couple times before he died, and what quite a guy. Uh, so, Jesuit causetry. It's a dishonest reasoning on questions of morality by application of general principles, like similar things like same-sex marriage, abortion, or the future Antichrist. Causatry is a system of rationalization to do legally what is forbidden morally. Sophistry, the Jesuit art of sophistry, the art of influencing the thought and conduct of an audience by argumentation that is seemingly plausible, but is actually invalid and misleading. Like 9-11 and the government's version of what happened. Or like the assassination of JFK, the assassination of Lincoln, the creation of NASA and what they tell us, and the lone gunman stories that you constantly hear was told to the general public. Remember, this lone gunman story is being taught as a fact in educational systems of the world. It seemingly sounds plausible, but fantasy is being taught as reality. That's what's going on in our politics today. Let me tell you something. I'm going to look at, let's look at this and then let me tell you a little so maybe I'll tell you the story now but if you think that I just got into this from reading and researching no I was firsthand living in Rome and I was working didn't understand much of what I, I do today and that's a process that you have to go through but at the time I was working as a uh, foreign correspondent and also I was working as an editor for the American newspaper there on Piazza Barbarini, and I was almost, Reagan was about to visit, and I was almost blown up in a supposed terrorist bomb. Uh, I thought it was an inside job after I, that's what got me started on this whole thing, because I was about 10 seconds away, me and another Italian, only two in the building at the time, and I'll save you all of the uh, details. But I was walking through the hallway where the bomb was set, and I happened to go downstairs, and I was about 10 seconds away from getting my head blown off. And that made me start thinking, who the hell would do something like this? And, you know, after researching it, I found out the paper was funded by the uh, CIA. And then I started researching who the exact CIA, you know, we hear words like Catholics in action, things like that. But the CIA has a really interesting beginning, and it starts with Pope Pius XII, of course. So anyway, uh, that's why I started researching this. I said, my God, I've been given a second chance. Maybe I don't want to go off this, you know, leave this world not understanding these people. I'm sitting here in Rome for seven years. I ought to know something. And so that's what got me going. And I doubt I've said this a lot of times. If I wasn't there, 
If I never went there and all I did was pick up things on the internet or books and things, even reading Samuel Morris's book about the greatest danger of the Jesuits in the Vatican to the to the to the foundations and the success of America, even listening to Lincoln's words, many other things, I still wouldn't have such a solid understanding and continue this unless I was there seeing it, smelling it, hearing it, and feeling it my own with my own two eyes and ears for those years. And uh, that's it. That's really uh, what leads me on to do this. And uh, let me tell you, though, I do miss the spaghetti, I, I have to admit, and an occasional glass of good wine that I don't spend a thousand dollars for. But anyway, let's look at how the two work together, that's uh, causatry and sophistry, Jesuit causatry and sophistry. That is a dishonest reasoning to open up the door to sophistry as a method of argument. How far is a Jesuit causatry and sophistry infiltrated our world today? Well, I call on my old friend Tupper Saucy, who wrote a book called Rulers of Evil that you have to read. And I always mention this because I said to Tupper when we were, when I first uh, was getting to know him. He mentioned to me and said, Greg, this is the tip of the iceberg. Keep going. Look for more because I'll tell you something. This is not going to, this is my book. And I'll tell you, it was a hell of a book. Uh, is only hitting the tip of the iceberg. There's so much and continue on. So I always have taken his advice, but man, what a good, what a really interesting fellow he was. Well, Rulers of Evil author Tupper Sassi, on chapter 9, page 74, America's understanding has been systematically bent to the will of the church militant, while the intellectual means for sensing the capture have been disconnected. Most of the content, folks, of our modern media, whether television, radio, print, film, stage, or web, is state-of-the-art Jesuit ratio studiorum. The Jesuit college, folks, is no longer just a chartered institution. It has become our entire social environment, the, the movies, the mall, the school, the home, the mind. Human experience has become a spiritual exercise managed by the charismatic spiritual directors who know how to manipulate a democracy's emotions, logic, perspective, national memory, and a self-discipline are purged to the point that unbridled emotional responses, as economist Thomas Sowell put it, are all we have left. So, there you have it. I wanted to end with that, and uh, with the Jesuits, and to go on right now to another evil organization, and that is the Nazi SS. Okay, so we've covered the Illuminati. You can get that yesterday. We just finished up with the Jesuits as our second evil organization, and our third is the Nazi SS. Now, there are still organizations that are following this train of thought, and their ideas. So let's talk about <clears throat> where it began. The Nazi SS. Okay, what is it? It's also known as the SS. And that really, folks, that's a shortened name for the Knights of the Holy See. And that's S-E-E. -E. And we're going to talk about the Holy See in a, in a, as one of our other evil organizations. But it's a Roman Catholic spiritual and military order, the SS first formed in 1933, based completely upon the Jesuit order structure upon the signing of the Sacred Reich Concordat between Franz von Papen, on behalf of Nazi Germany, and Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, Pope Pius XII, which has still not been canceled out today. It's still in existence. The term Nazi when was it first publicly used? And it was really used as the rebranded name for the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP. Now, don't we have something happening here in America, the Democratic Socialist Party? The NSDAP, 
in 1933 upon devout Catholic leader known as, I like to call him Father Adolf Hitler, assuming the office as German Chancellor, handpicked by Eugenia Pacelli, Pope Pius XII. The Nazi SS were also formally given birth under the Reich Concordat of 1933, with its first superior general being, <laughs> I call him Father Heinrich Himmler, S.J., who has personally attended the signing ceremony of the Reich Concordat in Rome in 1933 under the Reich Concordat, and having the same rank as the senior Roman Catholic cardinal, is the superior to the Fuhrer, the lay representative of the Nazi Knights. Okay? As a military order of the Roman Catholic Church, that's what I'm calling these people, the SS. Okay, the Knights of the Holy See, the Nazi SS, are bestowed by the infallible legal orders of the Roman Pontiff on behalf of the Mother Church to wage constant holy inquisition against all heretics, including assassinations, torture, counterintelligence, to protect the name of the Holy Roman Catholic Church and directly represent the interests of the Holy See as its primary order of the Holy Knights, the SS. Now, let me give you an example. Remember yesterday I mentioned the name of a man by the name of Father Edmund Walsh, Jesuit, who formed the school of, he founded the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. Well, one of his uh, assignments was to act as the overseer to the uh, uh, hearings on the, you know, to go with uh, our judges when we held all the hearings in Nuremberg for the Nazi war criminals. So he was the overseer telling the judge what to do. And if you look at what happened in Nuremberg, Everything that connected the Vatican and the Jesuits to the Nazis was never, ever put on the public record. Many of the high-level Nazis were not ever convicted, were given uh, new identifications through the Vatican rat lines, etc., sent off to different places, many different countries. And so there was a whitewashing there using the Jesuits. So when we read history, and none of this is told to us, you can watch, you can read any, you can see any movie, you can watch, read most books. They're never going to tell you about Father Edmund Walsh's really role when he went to Nuremberg. And I've called Georgetown and asked, and they give you the same story. Oh, we never heard of anything like that. Jesuit causatry and sophistry, and also their control of what they do with history, what they do with the educational system, is instrumental in this plan for a new world order and in their plan now to turn America into a socialist country. Now, as a military order, they are bestowed, like I said, with these, right, these legal orders of the Roman pontiff. And let's see, in what time? We got about a minute. Good that I looked at that. So as a primary Roman cat Catholic spiritual order charged with carrying out the executions of the Holy Inquisition, the Knights of the Holy See, Nazi SS, are tasked with rounding up large numbers of people, depriving them of their rights on claim of being heretics, and then, of course, killing them. Right? So we're going to get back to this subject of the Nazi SS as one of the most evil organizations in the world, their connection to the Vatican and the Jesuits, and why... Ask yourself, why do we know this? Why isn't this in our history books? I want all my money back from my history classes when I went to college. Don't you think? I mean, it's really easy. If you don't know, you can't be, you know, you can't be a threat to this. And most people today, and I find especially in America, are left, you know, speechless when they finally find out this stuff. Back in three minutes on the Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app. 
for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built, that's crossTheBorder.org. The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the Supreme, by the Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit command. command. But stand, but stand tall, tall, people. people. Listen, Listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, folks, Greg Anthony here, back for the second half hour of the investigative journal. We're going over the subject of there's a lot of evil in the world, and we're looking at another evil organization called the Nazi SS. We've also gone over the Illuminati, the Jesuits, and now we're on the SS. Now, remember I made a statement in the last half hour that maybe, uh, and perhaps there's a good reason to consider this, that the Jews in the Holocaust that were sent to the gas chambers weren't killed there, but then were put in ovens and burnt alive as a sacrifice. Now, ask yourself this question. Why did they go to such great expense to build all these ovens? You know, they, that's an expensive proposition. When in fact... They could have actually killed them. They could have starved them to death. And it's real cheap to you know, dig a really big hole and bury them all. Or why didn't uh, they do that after they killed them uh, in the gas chamber? Okay? But they went to great expense to build these ovens. So perhaps it was a sacrifice, right? Sacrifice to the gods. Human sacrifice these people are still alive when they're put in the ovens. Okay, so let's look at this. We're looking at the SS, and we left off, and as a spiritual order, I'm looking at these people as, of the Roman Catholic Church, the Nazis, like the Jesuits, were bestowed with the extraordinary Roman Catholic grace of being forgiven for all of their mortal sins, all of their killing, all of their atrocities, and therefore can go to heaven. That, unfortunately, must be done in order to observe its temporal orders. Now, let's, let's look at this, because you're probably thinking, if you have done no research on Pope Pius XII's connection to Hitler, 
then a lot of this won't make sense. But you'll have to bear with me and state that I've, we've done research in that. And I can make the statement beyond a reasonable doubt that Pope Pius XII picked Hitler. I can also state that probably Mein Kampf wasn't written by him and written by a Jesuit priest. And then we're moving to the organization now of the Nazis. And Hitler even mentioned that he modeled it mostly after the Jesuits and the Vatican order of things. So, you know, here we have this going on. So as members of this Catholic order holding the equivalent spiritual powers of priests, bishops, and even cardinals. Himmler, the Knights of the Holy See, have historically murdered heretics by sacrificing them in formal religious ceremonies. This is why, perhaps, over 18 million innocent people were burnt alive in ovens in Russia and Poland during World War II as the single largest mass human sacrifice in history, rather than cheaply, like I said, starving them to death or burying them alive or dead. Now also, if you don't know Stalin's connection to the Jesuits and have not researched it thoroughly, yes, then this is not going to make quite as much sense. So you've got to understand Stalin. I call him Father Joseph Stalin. He was trained by the Jesuits. And when you read his history, of course, the whitewash history isn't going to tell you that. Well, he was one of the boys. You bet he was. All right. And I don't have time to go over it, but you can check back and you can start researching it on your own. And I'll tell you, it's not an easy test because these things are not in the normal history books. And you know why? Because then they can counter you by stating, hey, this is crazy. What? What? Who? Who believes that? Now, Hitler and the foundation of this party, right? The Workers' Party. How did that happen? Well, it was born in the early 1920s as an evolution of the earliest political group, the extremist German Workers' Party, first founded by Anton uh, Drexler, 1884 to 1942 he lived, including others such as Gottfried Feder, Dietrich Eckhart, and Karl, I think his last name is Herr. Okay, so we got the nationalist, a German Workers' Party, and this was Hitler involved in, you know, this. Adolf first came to the contact with the DAP around June of 1919, five months after its formation, as a double agent and intelligence officer of the Catholic-controlled Bavarian uh, group, okay, was tasked with reporting on their activities. His acceptance into the ranks of the Catholic Bavarian Group Intelligence Network was thanks to the support of his patron, Catholic Papal Nuncio, at the time Archbishop Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, based in Munich at the time. Okay, so here we have Pacelli based in Munich and this connection to Hitler, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so for anyone to not recognize these things really shows that we're, we're missing the boat in history, right? We're not being given the truth. We all know they like to keep things from us, but this story is important. And that's why I try to bring it to you, because what I ask is only this, okay? That it is put on the table of discussion. But you see, our great scholars, our great historians, who also are involved with Jesuit causatry and sophistry, are not allowed to do this. And if they do, and they're very unpopular, they would be killed or discredited, not have a job. They wouldn't sit behind the ivory towers making all that money for nothing. Putting out book after book after book for what? <laughs> and I love, every time I think about all those crazy books that leave out everything, I always think of what Mark Twain said. He said, you know what? Being illiterate isn't so bad. Just think how many bad books you don't have to read. But anyway, from late 1919, okay, until he moved into Berlin in 1925, Hitler, it is reported, met with his mentor, Cardinal Pacelli, every few weeks and probably updated the Archbishop 
on his progress while receiving his next instructions. Testimony, as a matter of fact, to the regular and clockwork meetings of Hitler and Pacelli was given by the housekeeper and friend of Pacelli for 41 years, Sister Pastelina Lenhardt, L-E-H-N-E-R-T. So, we have this kind of information that will never get out. And I've tried to think, what, what, what does it remind you of today? I mean, we don't have a, a supposed Adolf Hitler. But we do have this movement of socialism, don't we, in the last year? And when you start looking at the origins of Alessandro Ocasio-Cortez, she immediately got the super title. Once you get your initials, you know, like OAC, then you're really important, right? Imagine if they thought I was important. My initials are GAS, gas. <laughs> He's a full of hot, a lot of hot air, isn't he? But when you look at Ocasio-Cortez's origins, she was selected by the Young Turks and the Socialist Democrats to be an actress. Yeah, they put out an actress calling, like an actress, like a Hollywood call. They needed a congressman, a socialist, to take over for the uh, in the districts where they thought they could topple moderate Democrats, so that they could not only have Cortez, they could start doing this all over. That's primary jumping, right? Get into these primaries where you can beat these moderate Democrats and put in their stooges like Ocasio Cortez, and man, pretty soon you got a Democratic Socialist Party, and that's what they're doing. And if you look at how Cortez got there. She was actually, it was a cattle call, like you would be if you were a Hollywood actress. We're looking for a congresswoman. She went there, auditioned, along with I don't know how many others, and she got the part. She was a bartender at the time, and her brother put her name in. They admit it. But now we see even CNN. Well, we know CNN would follow every word she says. But we even see Fox give her a lot of credit, you know. And I don't mean they don't, you know walk right over her, but she's on the news all the time, even on the even on the conservative stations. But they don't want to get to this story, do they? No, because I contend that they work together. All right, enough of that. So we're looking at now Sister Pascalina Lennart telling us that Pacelli met with Hitler all the time. Hitler was accepted as the 55th member of the German Workers 55th member of the German Workers Party and played no active role until the start of 1920 when this tiny German Workers Party was facing bankruptcy and extinction thanks to the disastrous management of the weekly published Thule Society newspaper The Munich Observer by Drexler, Feder, Eckhart and Harrer Rather than being reassigned to another intelligence project, Hitler was promptly and honorably discharged from military service by the end of February 1920 and overnight went from an unemployed minority party member to savior of the DAP by providing all the necessary gold and money to keep the Munich Observer and the DAP afloat. Now, where the hell did this money come from? Who's the richest organization in the world? Had it come through the money laundering of the Vatican, right? You know, in a measure of the influence and control Hitler now had as the miraculous financier, the party changed its name in March of 1920 to the Nationalist Socialist Democ what is it? The Nationalist Socialist German Workers Party, and the name of its paper was renamed to what? The People's Observer, in English translation. Later, later folks, the Jesuits wrote the lie in Mein Kampf that this strategic decision to change the party was made by an erratic alcoholic and drug addict, Dietrich Eckert. What is never mentioned is that Hitler came bearing millions of dollars of gold seemingly out of thin air to turn a small eclectic band into a political movement. Now, there was a failed NSDAP push for power by force. In spite of Hitler arranging the lifeline to keep this group afloat, 
the Thule Society members remained half-hearted in transforming it into a real political movement, yet unwilling to step aside. By early 1921, Cardinal Pacelli had also assisted Hitler by discreetly introducing key and trusted Catholic members such as Rudolf Hess, Hans Frank, Alfred Rosenberg, into the NSDAP. At an extraordinary party meeting on 28 July 1921, Hitler made his move and was voted in as chairman of the NSDAP against the wishes of its founders. Now, with its protege in charge, Cardinal Pacelli, then to be Pope, Paul, Pope Pius XII, pushed for the NSDAP to accelerate its transformation soon after being appointed Fuhrer, Superior General Vladimir Ledikowski, a Polish Superior General of the Jesuits. Wow. Poland was used, too, with all the death camps, right? Provided Jesuit priests to Adolf Hitler in 1921 to help establish a parliament par paramilitary wing to the NSDAP to be known as the what? The Brown Shirts, right? The first headed by Ernst Rome, the new official insignia of the party, the swastika, was now being adopted. Wow, quite interesting, isn't it? These connections, man. I, You know, let's sit back for a minute and digest some of this. Look, this kind of stuff, this kind of the, you know, fill in the blanks of what really happened, it's not an easy task. And the researchers that did it, I have to admit, much of this research has been done by a Jesuit insider, somebody who had really good connections from a family uh, that was a Jesuit family. You're not going to get this information, you know, by going to the local Jesuit uh, assistancy and go to their head of uh, uh, historical records, which I tried to get some of their, just to, you know, open the door. But you're shut off right away when you start talking like this. They don't want anything to do with you. Now, you're not going to get it from them. You're going to have to get it from kind of what I call spiritual whistleblowers, you know, that really have an inside scoop, an inside path to get some of this information that is left, you know, just dangling in the wind so that people never get the truth about these people. So... There's always a way. There's always more. So keep looking deeply. You never know where you're going to find some information on these people. But I'll tell you what. There's a brick wall between what the fantasy world is right now that we live in and the truth on that other side. And it's up to you to knock it down somehow, brick by brick. So, now, you know, I'm thinking back some of my experiences in Rome, which were, I kind of uh, put put it this way, it was half and half. Most Some of the years I was there, I had no idea of any of this. And I was even, I remember even one thing, when I first saw Rome and the Vatican, I said, maybe I can get closer to the church, because I was basically a, one of those lost Catholics, you know, atheist, you know, oh, they're, you know, going on living that way. And so when I really kind of turned the corner after a few couple years, and saw this evil going on, watched this Vatican Bank scandal and all this stuff. I watched, I mentioned Cardinal, uh, you know, I mentioned a good Cardinal who was the Vatican Bank president. Cardinal Marchenkis passed away in Phoenix. Uh, he was from Chicago, my hometown. And I watched this go on where he was indicted for bank fraud. He was a suspect in the murder of Roberto Calvi, the Bank of Ambrosiano president who was hung under the Blackfriars Bridge in London. And then I watched how the American military airlifted him to the United States. The Italian government was paid off by the Vatican a couple hundred million dollars. And then he lived his life at a, uh, arch di at a diocese in Phoenix, uh, playing golf every day. But here's the deal. So... When you look at all this stuff and you start realizing you have to figure this out to really understand how the world operates, uh, it is a subject that, I'll tell you what, 
You think you're going to get it from the likes of Rupert Murdoch and his newspapers and all of his stuff? You think you're going to get it from the likes of the people who own the Washington Post now? And all those, no way, they all work for them. I think Rupert Murdoch's a knight of Malta. He is a knight of Malta. So, I mean, this is something that you have to put the spiritual and the political together to ever come to a rationale of what is really going on today. Now, okay, for all of those people out there who don't believe that the left wing and the right wing in America at the top levels work together and who still have this idea that if my group of right wingers get together and we get president, we can change America. And if you're on the other side of the coin and think the same way about the Democrats, forget about it. I ask you all one question. How come that it was known that Trump was going to be president 10, 15 years even before it happened? And they told you that. They showed it to you. Oh, I'll bet they showed you on a cartoon on The Simpsons. That's a pretty important show when you think of it as the longest-running sitcom in American history. On, what, 25 years? I don't know how long. One of the longest. And why is it there? So they can tell you in advance what the hell they're doing. Then when you figure it out, they go, you're nuts. It's only a comedy. But there he came 10 or 15 years ago down that elevator looking exactly the same as he did when he did it. In, right before he won the presidency in 2016. Just put it out there, just asked. But anyway, let's kind of, I can't finish it today, but let's continue a little bit here with the one of the evilest organizations in the world, the Nazi SS. Uh, so now we got uh, Hitler in charge, thanks to Pacelli. And the plan given to Hitler by Cardinal Pacelli in the late 1921 that the NSDAP was to organize themselves as a Catholic militia ready to seize power within a year. Yet even with new recruits and millions of dollars of gold in the bank, the NSDAP demonstrated a complete lack of competence in organizing themselves into really a political military force. Okay, at this time. But in contrast, the National Fascist Party, headed by Benito Mussolini, with his black shirts, they're, they're all con you see, they're all connected. Now, Mussolini was the one that ushered in uh, Vatican City and gave them that concordat and gave them Vatican City, resurrecting the Vatican, in, you know, uh, giving them that uh, autonomy in Rome. Now, Mussolini with his black shirts demonstrated far more capability in winning at the Italian elections in 1922 and then staging a coup to seize total power in October 1922. So we're going to pick it up there uh, Monday. And we'll see the connections between Mussolini. Don't you see? You can see them right now in the Vatican, Hitler in the Vatican, we can even go to Stalin in the Vatican, so they're all there, and then we'll come back and talk about the connections to the West. And when you control both sides of these conflicts, you have a better chance of winning, don't you? You win either way. And their plan is to always do that. And their plan is to control both sides so they can get the synthesis, the outcome that they want. And let me tell you, it's a very simple outcome. It's a brand new world. New World Order, One World Order, One World Government, and then their prize and joy, a One World Satanic-based religion. It'll be great, but they're going to push it off as, you know, the new Messiah, perhaps. The Messiah has returned. Watch out for that. And it, it, that gets me into the most interesting, I always get into, and I want to end the show, only got a minute and a half here. We'll get back to these evil organizations next week. Well, one of, one of the greatest uh, researching uh, adventures is to get into all of these Mother Mary apparitions that occur all over the place and all of these sacred places. When you start seeing the fraudulent activity going on at Fatima, at Medjugorje, and you see all this stuff and the Jesuits involved in it, stealing money, ruining people's lives, it is an amazing story. And then you know what? I'm looking out into a tree, and I see Mother Mary coming down. And boy, if I started to talk about, maybe we'll turn 
this area into a, a monument. Then we'll put her in a little cave, little grotto, you know. Or old caves are very satanic, by the way. And um, then we'll make a lot of money off of it. And then there'll be a few children that saw her, and they'll end up, you know, yeah, you know where they ended up. <laughs> what story? I mean, it's an incredible story of how they fictionalize all this stuff and get people to believe these things and then profit from it. But yet they're revered in this country. So, folks, think about it. That's all. All you got to do is put it on the table, start researching it, and then let the chips fall. I mean, there are going to be arguments, sure. There are going to be people that disagree, and they're allowed to. But this story needs to be put on the table, and it's the most difficult one to get. I'm not saying believe it. I'm saying at least put the facts out there and see where they fall. And I tell you, right now, the same thing that I'm talking about here is going on somewhere, right this moment. And I'll tell you, they have their hands the Jesuit Vatican and all of this stuff. And it isn't for the benefit of America. That is for sure. It is the benefit for turning this country into something else, which was their agenda from the beginning. So that's where we are at. We're going to take a little time off this weekend. We'll be back Monday. I want you to have a good weekend. Love your family. You know, stay close to them. Have a good weekend. And I'll see you back Monday on the investigative journal. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.